Hi and welcome to my channel, I'm Simon and today I am back with on the first day of 2022. So happy, 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 happy new year. I think we're all glad to see 21 go. But before we can say a proper farewell to it, well this kind of video is a farewell to it because I'm going to be talking about my favourite books of 2021. Now I have in the past years gone by of booktube and um, having the past years gone by of booktube whatever um <laughs> the last few years of booktube kind of done several videos but i decided no i was going to be really really tough with myself and i have 15 favorite books and i have five honorable mentions which i don't normally love i think it's a bit of a booby prize thing but nothing wrong with a booby prize actually they can often be quite good fun um and sadly though i won't be giving out any prizes to these authors apart from my unconditional love and thanks for some blinking brilliant books that I read last year and yes I have been saving this top until this video especially so there we go right <clears throat> also just to let you know if I'm clearing my throat a lot and if I sound a little bit croaky than normal I nearly died about 20 minutes ago when I choked on a uh, quality street and um, other chocolates are available to choke on this was also a bad one because it was a it was a um, orange cream i mean what a way to go i've been i've been furious at least let me go on a big purple one anyway moving on moving on moving on moving on because i'm waffling i think it's also because i get quite nervous about this video because i know there's some of my favorite videos to watch and one of my favorite videos to make and once you're done you're done and that's the list there forever let's get on with the honorable mention so first of all book that i actually finished this morning but i did read 650 pages of it last year it was my last book of last year and it was Hanya Yanagihara's To Paradise now I want to give this an honourable mention because I think it's a corking corking book I still need it to settle with me um and it is an unusual thing for me to read a book from one year into the next but I'm all about chucking old rules out the window as much as I can um but I think what she does with this book is exceptional and I think actually the fact that it, it's kind of three books in three different styles, uh, you have kind of what I've described as a queer Edith Wharton element to the book at the beginning, you've got a really um, interesting and possibly slightly with everything going on in the world triggering um, future dystopia that I think she does brilliantly. Um, so yeah, I think it's a cool cut. I just, the middle section wasn't great for me. But um, yeah, I, I need to think about it because I think what she does overall is really, really clever. <clears throat> then a book that I haven't finished yet, but I listened, I have listened to most of um, last year, or I had listened to most of last year, I've got a little bit to go, and I wouldn't feel right not mentioning this book. It's The Transgender Issue by Sean Fay, An Argument for Justice. And this is one of the most impactful, um, honest, brilliant, thought-provoking books that I've read and a really important book that I think everyone should read, no matter how um, much of a ally or anything you are, you think you are, this book teaches you so much more. So I wanted to give this a mention. I just haven't finished it in time for the end of the year because I'm trying to chill out a little bit with all of those rules. Then one of probably the most fun reads that I had last year, but I think it's specific to a time of year, um, and that is Stay Another Day by Juno Dawson. Read this before Christmas, thought it was absolutely brilliant. It's kind of like the Christmas movie that everybody should see and must read. And yeah, if you're looking for something really, really good fun for next Christmas, make sure that you have this in advance. I'm the sort of person that can't read Christmassy books outside of Christmas, so that's why I couldn't pop it on this list, even though it was one of my favourite, fun, joyous reads of last year. And then the last two are more about sort of moments, really, for me. The first of which is Denise, ooh, nearly threw that, Denise Mina's Rizio, I can't speak, Denise Mina's Rizio, I think I've been overtaken by that um, orange cream. It's Denise Mina's Rizio, and this, um, I thought, was just Brilliant, and I happened to read it at the perfect time. I was going away to Scotland, I was reading it on the train, I was halfway through it, and then when we got there, we said, should we go to Holyrood Palace? We did, and we went to the room where Rizzio was murdered, and that's what this book is about, without giving too much away. Um, but it's also about Mary Queen of Scots and what was going on with her and the treachery around her and the plan to overthrow her. And I was just hooked by it. And I think reading it where it happened was just like such a brilliant moment for me. I'm really excited for the next in this series uh, that Polygon are doing, which is going to be Jenny Fagan's Hex, which I'm going to read very soon because I've already got the proof. So that was a corker. And then, last but not least, before we get on to the books of the year, my 15 favourite books, um, I have Did I Say That Out Loud by Fee Glover and Jane Garvey. And um, this is Notes on the Chuff of Life. I absolutely love their podcast, fortunately, and I've had the pleasure 
of being their sort of interviewee and host on tour this year in some of the biggest venues I've ever done. So the fact that I love the podcast, the fact that I've loved meeting them and getting to know them, the fact that I've got to do those gigs and the fact that this was such a brilliant read and the fact that I'm looking forward to doing my final one with them in February, um, which got postponed. Um, yeah, this has just been lots of memories in this book, lots and lots of memories. So let's get on to the top 15. Here we go. In 15th place, we have This One Sky Day by Leonie Ross. Now, this book is an absolute chunkster. It's absolutely stunning. And what I thought was so incredible about this book is I don't generally tend to pick up big books. And I will say the first chapter, I was a bit like, mm, I'm not sure about this, which is probably why it's not quite in my top 10. But I wouldn't feel right doing a video of my favourite books of the year and not including this. It's also called Poppy Show in America, for those of you over there. Hello. Um, and this is all about an island called Poppy Show, a fictional island that Leonie Ross has created where everybody has a little something something they've all got a little magical gift so it's brimming with magical realism brimming with kind of this otherliness about it which i loved it's also really funny quite dark and traumatic in parts it's really sexy it's just an absolute treat and by the end of it you feel like you know loads of the people living on the island with all of their extra something something you feel like you've got a whole history and a culture and and just this whole this whole world has been so brilliantly built and I just thought it was amazing and I'm really really looking forward to heading to Leonie Ross's back catalogue this year so if you haven't read it get to it I would like to reread this at some point I wonder if it's good on audio actually um because I think I'd get even more of it I wouldn't well you would get more of it if you read it again because you'd be getting more of it but I'd get even more out of it on audio a second read possibly so uh, we have that then in 14th place, although like, these are arbitrary numbers, it's not until we get to like the top six, but then the top six can all be a top number one at a different time. So really, all of these could be a top number two at a different time. Anyway, moving on. Um, we have at four, in 14th place, Kieran Millwood Hargrave and Tom DeFreston's Julia and the Shark. This book is stunning. Not only is it utterly, utterly, utterly beautiful like to read i mean honestly from the start it's absolutely gorgeous i'll show you that it's got like tracing paper um elements to it so i don't know if you can see that because i'm using this new funky version of um, my um, phone but um, i just thought it was beautiful and the way that the words and the imagery worked in with each other i thought was fantastic i'm gonna find one of my favorite pictures um but it's about a, a young girl called julia who moves away with her parents miles and miles away from where they live down south to one of the furthest islands in Scotland and uh, Julia's mum is looking for a shark that might be able to help with uh, Alzheimer's and um, as it goes on we, we learn more and more about Julia's mother and I don't want to give too much away but it's a book all about uh, mental health look at this I mean it's just stunning absolutely stunning and the message is really powerful I think the collaboration between the two of them is so brilliant and unique and perfect and yeah I just thought this was an absolute treat so uh, treat yourself to it frankly. In 13th place and lucky for some I'm gonna go with mm, I'm tossing up between two Ghosted by Jen Ashworth. Now I just have to be frank I know Jen <laughs> she's a friend of mine and um, this I think is her best book yet it's also the most her book like interestingly I was thinking about this with Juno I've had the pleasure of like catching up with Juno and I know Juno a little bit and have coffee with her and stay of the day is very much like sitting and having a coffee with Juno and like all the people kind of have her personality and it's the same with Ghosted there's this wryness to it that's very Jen and also there's something slightly supernatural about it which um Jen is very much into and it's about a woman who basically her husband has gone missing and she's looking for him but why has she not told the police what's been going on in their relationship what's going on in their house why is there weird noises and it's also about her carrying on whilst also sort of not carrying on in a lot of ways i just thought it was brilliant also that cover i mean i'm not being funny that's just stunning and i've actually spotted a few more books with um women's faces covered by flowers and i might just go with that as a theme of reading throughout this year because if the contents are all going to be as good as they are in this one well um i also love this because it really feels like a i'm from the north of england and i love books where i can feel that northern english vibe and this has that in abundance too um it's also very much about a working class character and also 
an unreliable narrator and that is just like savage catnip so this was a corker as was and this is the book that was kind of tossing up between which one got 12th and 13th sorry I did a little gasp there um <clears throat> So honestly, that like chocolate orange, I'm never having a chocolate orange again. So I do like the crispy ones. Moving on, not the green ones. Um, Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death uh, by Selena Godden. This is my uh, 12th favourite book of 2021. Um, this is all about Death, who is a middle-aged, working-class black woman. And she wants to kind of talk about what she's experienced, what she's done. And she finds this young man called Wolf. And we go on from there. And it's just a phenomenal book that takes you off into different time periods it kind of I don't love books set in London that much I loved this um because London is kind of a character in it but also a real heart of it and sometimes I can find that off-putting I lived in London I think it's written about too much this felt like a very different book in that aspect and also just the way that Selena Godden looks at death and how it celebrates life in a lot of ways. Um, this is kind of, I would say, a perfect book for now when we're still in a pandemic, um, but we're sort of processing it all and the grief and the shock. And I think this book looks at those things in really, really, really impressive ways. So an absolute treat of a book. Then for something really short and sharp. Well, do I want to move these around? No, I think this is right. See, honestly, they could move around at any given time. Um, Natasha Brown's Assembly. Um, I read this um, for Sky Arts um, Book Club. And I probably wouldn't have got to it as quickly if it hadn't been on there. Although I've heard loads and loads of people raving about it. And I'm so glad I did. Because this is sort of set in the, it's a single day-ish in one woman's life um, she is a black woman she's working in a blue chip sort of financial company in London and she has to go out to schools and say how you know everything's better and you can do anything and you'll be accepted but actually she's not really and she has to deal with lots of microaggressions and like little tiny moments of racism as well as some more sort of overt ones and we follow her through this as well as she's getting ready to go to a party after having some quite shocking news but she's going to a party for her boyfriends who is from a very privileged white old money family and it's just so brilliant. And it's so short and sharp. It's written in vignettes, which I absolutely love as a form of um, writing anyway. Um, and I just got so, 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 so much out of it. And I think she's such a talent. And I did have the pleasure of meeting Natasha and she was an absolute joy. when we talked about the Spice Girls. What more could you want? Um, but I just think she's the way that she has tried to formulate a book because she talks about that and how she's big into maths and she looked at sort of what is the formula to writing a book could have worked really badly and left it with no heart and just been like an exercise in writing this isn't this is a book that is so short but so brimming with so much in terms of themes and, and also so much relevancy for what's going on right now just amazing so loved that then we are on to is that my 11th so this is my 10th one two three four five six seven eight nine ten yeah 10th my 10th uh favorite book of the year um, and one that I think I've had in about seven different colours um, is Grown Ups by Marianne Keys, which I now have in purple which is my favourite colour so I didn't need it but I still got myself it um, and this is all about um, one family and um, it starts with um, now I'm going to get the names of the characters wrong Nell um, Nell who sorry I should say it centres around one family and the brothers in the family but actually it's about their partners and it starts with Nell one of the brothers wives having hit her head and at dinner for the family she starts to just tell all of the truths and spill all of the secrets and then we go backwards quite a long way I think it's like a year or so and in then we head towards it and we see what those secrets are because we only get hints of it at the beginning we have to go back and find out more um and I love the fact that different parts were named after different family gatherings. So you're always like waiting for, oh no, what's going to be the next thing? Like, where's this going to go? And I just loved it. And it could have been really complicated, but it totally wasn't. And yet it is intricate in so many ways. And I just think Marianne Keys is such a great writer. There's so many big themes dealt with in here with each of the different um, sort of sisters-in-law, I guess. Um, but she does it with a real, it's so human and so um, honest yet funny like some of the darker parts are still funny but that's life and that is what I felt like I'd, I felt like I had lived with this family as these secrets had been sort of created and then uncovered and it was just 
ace. So huge, huge, huge recommends to that. Then we head to, and I should say, I read that for Book Club, uh, me and Melanie's Book Club, and there's quite a few books from Book Club on this list, including Leave the World Behind by Ruman Allen, which I also got my brother a copy of for Yola Boca Flop, um, because I thought he'd really, really get this. And I think this is the sort of book that anybody could read and really, really love. Um, it is quite terrifying because it is about sort of, it has got an uh, apocalyptic feel to it, probably possibly an understatement. But we meet a family who are going away. They've rented an Airbnb, not far from New York, but out in the countryside to go and just get away from it all. And as they're doing so, something seems to have happened in the city and suddenly they can't get a signal and the TVs aren't working, but they think nothing of it. It's like they're on holiday. That is until there's a knock on the door and the two owners or supposed owners, they say they're the owners of the Airbnb, uh, house need somewhere to shelter and then things start to get weirder and weirder and weirder and what I love is the unease in this book builds up so subtly yet swiftly and is so it feels so real like it feels so plausible that this could happen but at the same time you're not quite sure what is happening because like nature's doing weird things the weather's a bit off you know tech is down um what's going on with yeah it, it's it's one of those books where nothing is 100% given to you and yet you're terrified along with, you can't stop reading it, it's got such a proportion to it as well. I thought this was absolutely brilliant. Really, 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 really good. And number eight, we have Diary of a Young Naturalist by Dara McNulty. And again, this is a book that I read for Book Club and it's one of my favourite episodes of Book Club that we call because we got heckled by a parrot. I mean, how often is that going to happen in your life? Which is so apt because this is all about nature. And this is Dara McNulty's memoir of a year in his life where his family were moving around and how um, he documents that how that changes for him both just as a, a young man but also as someone with autism and how nature soothes, heals, sort of grounds him through that but it's also very much a book about the climate crisis, it's also a book about like just noticing the little moments in nature like he really celebrates some of the more common or garden I guess you would say common or garden, garden animals and I loved that about it Yes, there are sort of some of the more, um, you know, some of the raptors and, and various other elements of the sort, sort of more extreme parts of nature that we have in, in the UK and, and Northern Ireland. But also it is all about those little moments and like there's little moments where he talks about how moss is like a forest for all these small bits. And they, oh, it's just so beautiful and also gave me a lot of hope in the youth of the future. So I thought that was incredible. Also had the pleasure of seeing an adaptation of that. Um, uh, what do they call it? It wasn't, it was a concert. I want to say a symposium, but that's not the right word. Symphony? No, it wasn't a symphony, it was something else. Anyway, it was brilliant. I got to meet Dara and he was a treat. Um, a book that I read whilst in the middle of nature. And I think actually sometimes the feelings around these are kind of what pushes them to the fore. Like, I think where you are when you read things can really, really matter. And I read this in um, a place that I discovered last year called Rhiogoch in Wales, where um, the lovely Mike and Preds have this incredible house that they inherited off um, another gay couple. And Mike's written a whole book about it called On the Red Hill, which is amazing. Um, and they do glamping. And we went and I read Summer Water while I was there, surrounded by the hills. And it did rain a bit. And this book is very much about um, a lot of people who have gone to these log cabins in I feel like it's Scotland um, and it's raining the whole time and we get to sort of hop from each of them over a couple of days where we know something probably quite bad is going to happen because that's sort of what Sarah Moss likes doing but also the atmosphere and the tension build and build and build as we go. What I thought was phenomenal about this is often with the book and I should say I also read The Fell by Sarah Moss and that was amazing but I think this just beats it a little bit for how deeply rooted in so many characters I got and how the tension just built and built and built. And I was just, I literally couldn't put this down. And it's it's very, it's not a literary thriller, yet it kind of is a literary thriller. Um, but also what it's saying about the world right now and what, which the fell does in terms of pandemic, this is more, I suppose, around the sort of the repercussions of Brexit. Sorry to mention Brexit and the pandemic twice in two mere minutes in a first video of a new year, whoops. Um, but, yeah, I just loved it. And it was all those moments where you thought, yeah, I know that. I've, I've been in that situation. Oh, I know what that person's thinking and how you get to see all the layers of their thoughts and their characters. And at the same time as this atmosphere broods and we know we're heading to something quite awful happening, 
we're kind of captivated by all of them yet slightly distant and it's just a really deftly done piece of work so amazing now here i'm at a point where i think any of these six books could be my favorite book of the year on a different given day and also what has kind of surprised me is one how much non-fiction there is in the top six and um, and also how queer it is um because whilst being a member of the lgbtqia plus community i don't tend to read that much queer fiction or non-fiction at all and yet this year it has been what i have kind of reveled in most i guess or revels not quite the word because some of it is quite traumatic um but yes here they are and i feel like i need to move them around again right in sixth place yeah i'll move them a little bit in sixth place we have what It Feels Like for a Girl by Paris Lees. And um, again, a book that I read for Sky Arts Book Club, possibly wouldn't have got to as soon if I hadn't listened to it on audio. It's Paris's memoir of their life growing up, taking us through the highs, the lows. It's a roller coaster of a rollicking read. Um, and it does kind of read like fiction, but Paris says that's what they wanted. They wanted it to be something that was kind of unputdownable. And it gives us so much insight into northern working class queer trans lives and from i think a way that we haven't read that much of i think with certain subject matters or certain um parts of society there tends to be certain sorry gasping here um there tends to be like specific voices that come to the fore and i don't think paris's has been heard enough or the likes of Paris's have been heard enough, and I hope this will mean that more Paris's get published, if that makes sense. Um, but I just thought this was brilliant. I was on the edge of my seat throughout loads of it. I was laughing like a drain throughout quite a lot of it. I was incredibly moved and upset by some of it, and just thought it was utterly, utterly brilliant. And it's done in a Nottinghamshire dialect. Uh, my family are from Derbyshire, but my, well, I was brought up in Derbyshire, but my granddad's side of the family were all from Nottinghamshire. There's a there's a um, church in Nottinghamshire that has the most savages in sort of in graves. Wow, we're going on a right old journey with this book, aren't we? Um, so yeah, basically my roots are from there. And listening to Paris read it with the Nottinghamshire dialect was just an absolute treat. It's almost like poetry, honestly, it's so brilliant. So please, please, please read this. And actually, yeah, like I said, any one of these could be number one. Then we have a book that hasn't had much discussion and I want everyone to go and read this who hasn't already. It's My Mess is a Bit of a Life by Georgia Pritchett. And it says, Adventures in Anxiety, which made me slightly anxious before reading it because I was thinking, oh, I get anxiety. And is this book going to make me anxious? And it's something that I veer away from. It's one of the reasons that I don't read books about um, people who have, um, oh my goodness, what chronic illnesses, which I have myself have a chronic illness, less known one called Durkham's. And I tend to avoid books about chronic illness because I feel like it's going to make me really tense and anxious. And the same with anxiety, because my anxiety, when it turns up, is paranoid and it's horrific. Not at all in this case. This is very much about how Georgia has lived with anxiety throughout her life. But it looks at her life from pretty much birth and it's told in these wonderful vignettes and um i just um there's something about vignettes i don't know what it is that i absolutely love um and she i just laughed like a drain where's that term come from i've used it twice and i've used it for years but i laughed and laughed and laughed annoyed actually chris with how much i was laughing at this and how much i kept telling him excerpts from it um but it just it's the way not only as George's life goes on, do lots of unexpected things happen as you read along. And I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but there's things around love and there's things around who we love and how that can be a real surprise. And there's some very moving and painful stuff on trying to have children. And then what happens if you do have children? Um, but what I loved was just throughout it, it was so humane. It was so honest. It was so... I felt like a friend, I really want to be Georgia Pritchett's best mate, basically, because I felt like a friend was telling me their life story, like over snippets, over se several different coffees, although, again, I was in Riagoch in the middle of nowhere in the Welsh countryside. Um, and yeah, it was just such a 
joy, just a joy, even though there are some very difficult parts. Um, Georgia Pritchett is a, a writer and um, she wrote for Miranda, which is a show I loved. She writes for Succession um, and she talks about how difficult it's been to be a woman in that industry, but she also talks about how she's seen people have it much worse, for example, people of colour in the industry, um, but also just the highs and lows of life and the pitfalls that we go through. Honestly, I could talk about this book for hours. I just think it is uh, amazing. So please, please read it if you haven't. Then in fourth place, but like I said, these could all be number one at different points, we have Dear Centran, um, a black spirit memoir by Kwake Ameze. This book um, absolutely just blew my mind. Um, it reminded me a bit in a way of the effect that Argonauts by Maggie Nelson had, where I said like, it's like the author takes the top of your head off, pours loads of ideas and thoughts and it just pops to the top of your head back on, shakes it and say, go away and have a good think about that. And that's what Kwake Ameze does, particularly around gender. Um, so Akweke Meze um, was one of the first uh, trans people to be on the Women's Prize um, long list and all, that caused a huge amount of debate but actually they don't believe they are a transgender at all, they believe they are a black spirit and that's what this looks at through letters to various different people in their lives when they've done things that have been because of this and what that is in your brain when, you're, when there's nobody there's no, there's no one to see who is like you and how othered you can feel, and especially how othered you can feel by other people who are saying they're othered. Um, and it's just phenomenal. Uh, yeah, I can't recommend it enough. I mean, trigger warnings with this one, it does look at suicide, it looks at body dysmorphia, um, and it's very frank on those subjects, but I just think it's such an important book. And A Quake Meze has become one of my all time favourite authors. I'm so thrilled I have three of their books to look forward to this year because just amazing. Then in third place, and this might shock some people, um, we have The Prophets by Robert Jones Jr. And this is out in paperback very soon in the same pink edition. I got this from Australia because I wanted it so much. Um, anyway, I, I talked about this a lot. I dedicated a whole video to it at the beginning of the year. Um, this book is about two men on a plantation who fall in love before homosexuality had a label. Um, and it's how people react to them. And um, some people are great about it. Some people are not so good. There's hypocrisy and some of that. But also it's about slavery. And it's about the history of how slaves ended up where they are. There's this you go back um, to uh, part of um, Africa's past, um, which I thought was brilliantly done. And also there's this amazing voice of kind of um, a choral voice throughout it, which I really, really love too. Um, it just had me spellbound. I thought the writing was incredible. And I think as well with this book, it felt like all, not all of them, but like it felt like a huge amount of voices who never got to tell their stories and never will do, it felt like Robert Jones Jr. was channeling those people. And that just, I think, makes it for such an incredibly emotional read. This book should have been on all the Blinking Prize longlist and shortlist. I'm really miffed off, actually, that it, is, it hasn't been. I think it's been hugely overlooked by prizes, and that's free. But it gets a special prize from me because I just think it is one of the most incredible books. If you haven't read this, you must. The end. Penultimately, at number two, we have a book that I read in one sitting. I didn't know what to expect from it. Um, and I just fell in love with it. And I'm annoyed with myself because I haven't read uh, the author's other book that came out this year. But I've got something to look forward to in 2022. That means uh, this is, in the end, it was all about love by Musa Okwonga. And I just, this book is just so incredible. And it's it's a book that sort of doesn't sit in a genre which is something I want to read a lot more of so if you've got any recommendations of books that are sort of auto fiction this sort of memoir they might not be but they also try lots of different things there's poetry in here there's sort of a memoir element there's yeah I, and also vignettes I mean I'm all about the vignettes then let me know in the comments down below but um this book is all about a black man who moves to Berlin um he's bisexual he moves when he's 40 and he starts a whole new life there and it's how he goes about that, how that goes well, how it doesn't go well, what he's really looking for. And that is to just find his his place. But at the same time, we also learn that his father died at 40. So he's now reached the age that his father, um, well, the age that when his father died. 
And so there's a whole lot around what that does mentally for him. And, and it's weird actually, because my first stepdad died when he was 29, I think. And I remember thinking about that a lot of the time that I'd lived, and I still think about it now, like I have lived him by a long time and it does really mess with you. Um, so I think that's another area that I really, this really, really resonated with me. And by the end of it, I just fell in love with Musa Congo because I mentioned that it's a book that it, it sort of doesn't, it's genre defying in the fact that it's sort of memoir, it's sort of fiction because when you learn about um, Musa, this is very much his experience. And I wondered if like, there's something about fictionalizing it that both at once keeps you, I suppose, distant from the author, but also, fiction can really really make you relate so that's just something that I found interesting reading it but yeah um I thought this was amazing and if you haven't read it yet do it's from Rough Trade Books which is a um small press I want to read a lot more small presses this year and um, because if they're churning out books like these that other big publishers aren't then that's where I want to be at that said though my final book of the year my number one spot is from a big publisher um, and it's from one of my favourite authors who I should also say I'm friends with and love dearly um, and again I think this book has so much of their personality within it and the joy and hope and funny nature and just delight um, and this book is all of those things and what I think made this book stand out for me in the last year was that it was so much joy and so much hope and it was intended to be that and I think sometimes we forget that with books I think we can go into books and you know you learn a lot from this book and it's all about um, found family and it's all about um, acceptance and all those things but I sometimes think we go into books where it's all about like and I do it I'm, I'm I'm well aware that I do it, uh, where we go into books that are difficult and tricky and we sort of almost like want to put ourselves through something uh, in order to feel the fiction really work. Whereas this, you're just putting yourself through absolute delight. I mean, there are highs and lows with all the characters. What is the book, Simon? Just get on with it. You'd have probably guessed. It's Still Life by Sarah Women. And I just think this is phenomenal. You'll all probably know if you've been here for a long time. And if you're not, hello if you're new. Um, but you'll all if you've been here a while will know how much I love Tin Man and I wasn't nervous about this book because I've loved every single book that Sarah's written and actually Sarah and I were saying because we did an event together last year for Still Life that um the first ever book event I hosted was with Sarah and it was 10 years ago last year and there's just something quite lovely and delightful about that which has not got nothing to do with the book but I just thought I'd tell you that anyway um so anyway, this is all about Ulysses Temper and Evelyn Skinner who meet uh, during the war on one random night where Evelyn has been um, out with uh, some other, I don't want to use the word spinsters, but with some other slightly uh, older single ladies um, having a lovely time while the war goes on in the background. And there has been this incident where some they're trying to save art basically. And so Evelyn and Ulysses meet there and they just have this moment which is just all about this bond and this friendship and this sort of thread between them of I don't know just the special thing it's not romantic it's not it's just this thing this connection that we sometimes get with people and it's a connection that stays with them both after that meeting and carries on and it's how we see their lives occasionally almost merge and they almost bump into each other again um but it's also then how Ulysses afterwards saves a man's life that's not too much for spoilers to give away and ends up getting left um years later this italian um, apartment and once he goes back to london where we find out all the things that have been going on that he has no idea about including what's happened to his uh, girlfriend peg um and like the landlord and there's even a talking parrot in it and i normally don't like talking animals and it's just it, it's then how sorry he creates this sort of band of people who then go off and have this event I, I can't give too much more away. I don't want to spoil it for anyone because part of the joy is just going along with them and having the best time. But I felt so much love and warmth and joy and happiness from this book. I also think Sarah Woman is a genius in the way that she can write a like paragraph, which will be a whole story. Like there's an incident of murder and dispersing of a body. One paragraph, but I'll never forget it. Um, and it's just moments like that, that that are brimming inside this book, which really celebrates what it is to be human. It celebrates 
Europe and togetherness. It celebrates helping each other. It celebrates found family. It celebrates love in all its different forms. It's just celebratory. It's just joyous and it's just what I needed in 2021. And I think it's what we all need going forward into 2022. So there we go. Those are the books of 2021, my favourite books of 2021. I know it's a bit of a longer video than normal. I think I'll have done it as a premiere, so I'll be chatting away with you as you watch it. I'll be back tomorrow with a reading vlog going back all the way to this book. Oh, didn't prepare this very well, did I? No, I need to get more preparation in 2022. Uh, yeah, I've, I've filmed uh, a week's worth of reading this book with my thoughts long away. No spoilers, um, but just my thoughts as I went. And uh, yeah, that will be back tomorrow. And then I'm back on Tuesday with my 2021 intentions, both, well not both, but for the channel, for reading and also just for life over the next year. So I will see you all tomorrow and then, and then on Thursday. And then, yeah, I think I'm going to be Tuesdays, Thursdays and Sundays this year after this video or Sundays, Tuesdays and Thursdays and Sundays and Tuesdays and Thursdays um, this year. But let me know what your favourite books have been and let me know what you've most enjoyed on my channel in the last year or last year. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the adventures, the reading adventures that we're going to go on over the next coming 12 months. Don't know how to end this video, so I'll just say Bye-bye, Happy New Year, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.